Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. My name is Janelle Crott Baker, and I'm an associate professor at Memphis Theological Seminary. And I teach courses there in mission and evangelism. I also teach sociology of religion electives and interfaith intercultural electives. So today we're going to be talking about Christianity and empire. And today it's going to be mostly a historical exploration of the relationship between the two. And then next week, we'll focus mostly on the present and alternatives to the Christendom approach of um, the idea that Christianity is, is linked with empire. Christianity is a territorial religion. So thanks for, for being here. If you have any questions um, at any point or comments, you can put them in the Q&A. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time to address those questions. So I want to start, of course, with the Roman Empire. So Christianity was birthed um, in the middle of the Roman Empire, Roman occupation in Palestine. And those of you familiar with the Gospels in the New Testament know that this looms large in the context of the New Testament and even in Jesus's ministry. And within the Roman Empire um, in the first three centuries, Christianity was an outlawed religion. And so we see this in the New Testament, this questioning of you know, what is, what is the role of Christians with regard to homage and allegiance to the Roman Empire? A number of Jesus' disciples are um, activists, um, revolutionaries, even some of them, against Roman occupation and the oppression that that brought, um, especially to people who were not citizens in the Roman Empire. And throughout the first three centuries of Christianity at various points, there were persecutions and even some martyrdoms. Sometimes those persecutions and martyrdoms are a little overblown in terms of percentages of, of Christians or percentage of the population that, was, that, were, that were martyred. But still, this was a phenomenon that left the Christian community in fear um, and also um, left them asking questions about witness. And what did it mean for them to embrace their Christian faith and the mission, their vocation um, in the midst of persecution? And there's also the, the phrase that the, um, the martyrdom is the, or the, the blood of the martyrs are the seeds of the church, that this actually grew Christianity. And there is some evidence to suggest that persecution actually made um, the faith more solidified um, for those who became Christians knowing about this persecution um, that it, it really cemented their um, place in the Christian community since so much was at stake. But it also meant that um, for many communities, the risks of joining the community were just, the Christian community were just too high. Well, things change with Emperor Constantine and on the right, you can see an artistic rendering of the Battle of Milvian Bridge, and you can see Constantine in the middle there on a white horse. And with the Battle of Milvian Bridge, Constantine, as emperor of the Roman Empire, has this vision, um, and he sees a cross in this vision and hears the words, in this conquer. And um, he defeats his adversary in this battle and embraces the Christian religion. Constantine's own faith is, is a matter of some dispute. Um, he, for, for many years, put off baptism. And the question of whether um, his conversion was political um, solely, it was certainly um, political in nature, but whether it was also personal is a question that's up to, to debate. But nonetheless, the status of Christianity changed. And with the Edict of Milan in 313 CE, Christianity becomes legal in the Roman Empire. Um, and then fast forward to 380, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire with the Edict of Thessalonica. 
And then in the Theodosian Code in 439, we see Christianity codified in the Roman Empire. And historians often look back at this time period as the birth of Christendom. And now we see the relationship between Christianity and empire changing with Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire. The power of the church and the power of the state are often intertwined. And there is also a, a presentation of Christianity as a territorial religion. You have Christendom and heathendom. You have the territory of the church and the territory that falls outside of the church. And with this perception, there was also the perception, especially for those Christians within the Roman Empire, that those outside of Christendom were also um, outside of culture. So the linkage between Christianity and, quote, civilization, we see with this marriage of empire and Christianity and Christendom. I think it's also important to note, however, that there were Christian communities outside of the Roman Empire as well. Sometimes people identify Christianity as a Western religion, but this is only true for certain um, times and places in history. And historian, there's a historian, Andrew Walls, who talks about Christianity as having shifting centers and porous boundaries, and that the center of the Christian community worldwide has always shifted. And even in the early centuries of Christian history, there were Christian communities outside of the Roman Empire. We can look at the East Syriacs in the Middle East, we can look at Ethiopian Christians, we can look at Maritama Christians in India. And so it's important to, to recognize that there were minority Christians outside of the Roman Empire. And throughout Christian history, there have been non-Western Christians. And as we'll talk about later in the presentation, the majority of Christians now live outside of Europe and North America. So if we look at this map, we can see how much the area in which the population was predominantly Christian shifted with Constantine's conversion to Christianity. So you see prior to 300, these dark blue slots, spots are kind of patchy. Um, various communities built around cities. Many of these cities you'll recognize from Paul's missionary journey. Um, then from 300 to 600, we see that the areas in which um, predominant, are predominantly Christian expand greatly. Um, and then um, into 800, we see Northern Europe becomes predominantly Christian. Let's talk a bit about Christianity and empire in the medieval period. And as you know, the Roman empire declined and fell um, from about 400 onward. And the idea of Romanitas, the culture of the Roman Empire, often linked with you know, high culture, with reason, um, with civilization, shorthand Romanitas, that um, within the medieval period, many Christians saw Christianity as the way to preserve the sense of, of Roman culture. Um, and this idea of culture and Christianity being the carriers of the empire that had fallen politically was prominent, especially among the elite. It's also important to note that in the medieval period, like many periods before, Christianity was understood as a territorial religion. Um, and we can see this in the Crusades with this notion of uh, protecting Christian territory against the advance of Islam. Um, but also with this territorial understanding was the practice of conversion and mass. So we see this with the Germanic tribes that if a leader converted, the tribe was expected to follow suit. So religion in this time period, religious identity for most people was a matter of inheritance rather than choice. And so the territorial designation then for Christianity is linked with that, the idea that religion is, is a part of a people group's identity and not a matter of individual choice. Um, the Crusades were often 
labeled and marketed as a defense of Christendom. Um, and oftentimes um, Muslims, um, the, the enemies were perceived as, as being heathens or even representatives of the devil. We also see in the medieval period a confluence of the medieval institutions of church and state. So the Catholic Church um, has a lot of political power, the largest landowner in Europe. We often see um, leaders within the Catholic Church having political power. And so the power of the church and the power of the empire is often uh, one and the same. And even the designation the Holy Roman Empire, which is um, present day Germany and a lot of other surrounding territories is this continuation of the idea of the linkage between church and state. Here you can see, um, if we fast forward the map a bit, um, the extent of Christianity in about 1100 CE, we see it, it's expanded further into no Northern Europe, into Russia, and the separation of the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, you can see that red line there. And even there, this was considered a territorial designation. So if you were to the West, you were part of the Roman Catholic Church. If you were to the East, you were part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And of course, there are continuing independent um, churches, you can see in the map. Um, and also there are um, Catholics outside of the Roman Rite in other parts of the Mediterranean world. But again, we can see this understanding of Christendom as, or as Christianity as territorial right on the map. Let's talk about Christianity and empire in the modern period. And I think for contemporary Christians, this is when we think about the relationship between Christianity and empire, this is often what we think about, particularly with the so-called age of discovery and exploration and conquest. So with the quote unquote discovery of the new world and the, um, the, the exploratory, exploratory missions of various crowns, the Spanish, the Italians, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, we see Christendom in a new garb. And here, this notion of Christen Christianity linked with territory um, becomes um, a, a method of colonialism, it becomes a method of conquest. We see this all over the so-called New World, um, both in Spanish, Portuguese, and English, Dutch colonies. Um, the contemporary use of the term mission um, prior to the 15th century, we didn't see that term. Instead, mission was understood as the relationship between the Trinity, the Father sends the Son, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. But the idea of mission as Christians going out into the world, often with an evangelistic uh, mission, this um, idea did not become popular until the Jesuit order emerged and the Jesuit order began their project of establishing missions around the world. With the Protestant Reformation, we see Christendom in new flavors, competing empires, but we do not see a delinking of Christianity and political powers. In fact, with the Protestant Reformation, we see Europe divided up into competing empires where church and state were still linked, where there was fights for identity, whether particular uh, states would become Catholic, Protestant, and much blood was shed over these questions in the wars of religion. But even so, the link between Christianity and empire remains strong. Within this period, we also see the rise of nationalism, Europe and other parts of the world, and national identity continues to be tied to religious identity. In the modern period, starting in about 1500 and moving forward, there's a complex relationship between mission and colonialism. On one hand, the colonial empires bring with them missionaries 
missionaries are representatives of the state and later the companies um, that such as the Dutch East Indies companies, but we also see um, Christian leaders rebelling against what they see as exploitation under the name of expanding Christendom. So here I've, I've um, included a couple of, of uh, pictorial renderings of some missionaries. Um, on the top right, we have Matteo Ricci, who was a Jesuit missionary in China. And he saw it as his mission to become um, part of Chinese culture. He embraced um, Confucian ideas. He used the Confucian idea for God. Um, he was interested in the ideas of Chinese people and wanted to foster dialogue. Um, his approach was very unique within the time period. And um, because of, of his efforts and the efforts of other Jesuits, the Jesuit order was censured by the church on numerous occasions. Um, on the top left, you can see this is a, a Spanish um, priest um, who is baptizing a Native American. Um, and this, I think, represents a more typical picture of the relationship between mission and colonialism with conquest and conversion going hand in hand. And the idea that not only was it the right of Christians to take over territories of Native Americans, but it was their duty. On the bottom, we see um, on the right, it's Beth Betsy Stockton. She was an African-American missionary to Hawaii with the Presbyterian Church. And I think she illustrates that within the, the, the church at the time, we continue to see hierarchical designations based on gender and race. But yet within the mission field, there were opportunities for women and for African-American women that didn't exist in other societies. Um, unfortunately, this went along with a hierarchical, racialized understanding of humans, with women being able to teach as long as they were teaching brown-skinned people outside of the designated um, territories of Christendom in the United States and Europe um, for Presbyterians. On the bottom left, we see David Livingston. David Livingston was a doctor and a missionary in Africa and while he often saw himself as an ally with African peoples, the maps that he made, for instance, were later used um, by European empires in their colonization project. So in one person, we can see this complex relationship between mission and colonialism. There were also examples of Christians involved in Christian mission who reacted against the subjugation of native peoples. A prominent example is Bartolome de las Casas, who was working in the contemporary um, Dominican Republic in Haiti at the time called Hispaniola. And he wrote a number of treatises. He was enga engaged in a debate um, back in Europe, um, back in Spain, where he was advocating for the rights of native people and decrying the treatment of native, native people on, the, on behalf of Spanish Christians. So here you can see an excerpt from um, one of his treatises. We fast forward a little bit. We, here is a picture of William Carey, who was a Baptist minister from Britain. And in 1792, he published a treatise called An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of the heathens. William Carey argues that the Great Commission did not just apply to the disciples and the apostles in Jesus' age, but that it applied to all Christians. And it was the duty of Christians to evangelize. Um, he says that we must use every lawful method to spread the knowledge of his name. William Carey has a view of salvation that is otherworldly and focuses on heaven and hell. He talks about the obligation of Christians to rescue the quote unquote heathens from hell and that it is the responsibility of every Christian 
Um, this is often seen as a prelude to what is sometimes called the great century of Protestant mission, the 19th century, when we see a burgeoning of Protestant mission efforts on behalf of American and European Protestants all over the world. Within this paradigm, in the great century and the modern period in general, there are understandings of mission that were prominent and linked to this idea of Christianity as Christendom, as a territory. So mission under this period was understood by both Catholics and Protestants as the propagation of the faith. Of course, they had different interpretations of what that faith was, but nonetheless, this is what mission was understood to be. Mission as the expansion of Christian territory, the idea of building the kingdom, enlarging the kingdom, and that we have the territory of Christendom and we have heathendom. And heathendom is a land of darkness, of demonic forces, of people who are lost, and the realm of, of uh, Christendom is those who are within the church in a Catholic conception, those who are saved within an evangelical conception, but nonetheless we see this, this uh, strong territorial understanding. Mission as the cultural arm of imperialism. So even the motto, Christianize to civilize, that Christianity was seen as a tool of, of cultural imperialism, a, a tool of um, what, what many would call at the time civilization um, being extended to those who were perceived as uncivilized. So we see a cultural superiority um, and later on linked with a racial superiority notion being connected to mission. Mission is conversion of the heathen. Um, especially for Protestants, there was an understanding of those saved in one ledger, those unsaved in the other, and the idea of bringing folks from one column to the other. In a Catholic understanding, this was often linked with those who belonged to the church, those who had been baptized. And then finally, as mission is the founding of new churches. And here we see competition between various denominations, um, and many denominations made no bones, we're not secret, about their desire to build their churches, to build their denominations in competition with other denominations. Christendom in the modern period as, as cover for exploitation, as I mentioned in the last slide, um, during this time period, Christianity was often linked with quote unquote, Western civilization. The notion of, of Christianity as preserving um, Western culture, a number of, con of slogans, ideas accompanied this, institutions. In the Spanish, quote unquote, new world, the slogan, God, gold, and glory was a prominent um, slogan and later understanding, historical understanding of mission within this time period. The reduciones um, within the Spanish New World and the Portuguese New World, the idea that because of their Christian identity, the Spanish and the Portuguese had the right to subjugate native peoples. Um, and the idea that the subjugation was justified because of, they had the right religion um, and they had the truth and it could be forced on native people and that because of their inferior religion, their inferior civilization, that they were in a natural position of subjugation. The idea of the twin aims of Christianize and civilize, particularly in the US context, context we see the slogan of manifest destiny. Um, this artistic piece here by John Gast, American Progress is a depiction of this manifest destiny, the idea that it was, it was God's will for European settlers to settle in um, the entire North American con context, the entire North American continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, and manifest destiny is this doctrine was a justification for 
the forced removal and genocide of Native Americans across the continent. White man's burden, the idea that it was not only the right, but the duty of white men, and I think that um, you know the gender language here is no accident, white men to rule the world. And, but it was also their responsibility then to bring other people whose race, whose culture, whose religion was inferior um, into the light, into the truth of Christianity. So to Christianize and to civilize was the duty of, of white Christians. Um, you can see here this head of Christ, um, artistic piece by Warner Salman, um, even the idea of Jesus as a white, fair-skinned, blue-eyed man, which of course is historically uh, wildly inaccurate, but this idea of Jesus as white, as Christianity, as a white religion, the white savior complex is prominent in the modern period as a cover for exploitation of non-white peoples. Plantation theology, that there is an order to the universe and this order entails that white Christians rule and that those under their rule are fortunate to be introduced to the truth. And finally, this idea of capitalism as the Christian economic system. Capitalism being linked with Christianity as the economic system that God had designed for the world. I see there's a couple of, of comments in the in the chat, so I'm gonna just go there a second. So I see there's a question about making amends um, for the sins of colonialism, um, making reparations. And Jack, I'm glad you asked that question. That's gonna be, I'm sorry to put it off, but that is gonna be the focus of next week's session on looking at Christianity and, and empire, the legacy of Christianity and empire, and what the call is for contemporary Christians, particularly con contemporary Christians who are in privileged positions in society to make amends and to repair the harm that has been done. So thank you for that question, Jack. So this is not the full story. Meanwhile, in the 20th century, we can see upheavals to this Christendom notion. And one of the main upheavals that I think we can see with this linkage of Christianity and empire is the ascent of non-Western Christianity all over the world. So whereas in the 19th century, we see mission efforts on behalf of, of white Christians from Europe and North America all over the world, it is not until the 20th century that we see Christianity growing dramatically um, in non-Western contexts, particularly in Africa and Latin America, but also various parts of Asia. And historians have, have noted, have argued that the growth of Christianity around the world is not predominantly due to the efforts of Western missionaries, but rather predominantly to the efforts of local Christians within those own contexts. So Western missionaries, um, perhaps their most lasting contribution was the translation of the Bible into other languages. Um, so those translation efforts mattered greatly, um, but once people had access to the scriptures in their own language, the growth of Christianity was largely under the leadership of local Christians with its own distinct local flavor rather than um, an import from the West. We also see divisions, strong divisions within Christianity, particularly in um, the US context, but also in other parts of the world, the fundamentalist modernist division, there's no longer you know, this broad sweeping Protestantism as um, being joined with, with all Christians. Certainly there had been um, diversity within Protestantism before, but we see a stark divide with the fundamentalist modernist controversy between liberal um, Christians on one hand and evangelicals on the other. 
the ecumenical movement is a desire to bring all Christians, or all Protestant Christians that initially conceived. Later on, we see cooperation with Catholics as well. The Edinburgh Missionary Conference of, of uh, 1919 uh, is a, a good example of the ecumenical movement. Um, but within this ecumenical movement, a um, hundred years ago, when we look back, we can see that this ecumenical movement is still understood as largely a Western phenomenon, that Western Christians are the actors in the ecumenical movement. Um, however, what the Edinburgh Missionary Conference got wrong, drastically wrong a hundred years ago, was that this movement um, would largely be led by Christians from around the world. We also see Pentecostalism um, gaining force and becoming the predominant expression of Christian faith in many parts of Africa in particular. World War I and later World War II also saw a crisis of confidence in this idea of progress of Europeans and Americans as white-skinned people ushering in um, utopia, ushering in a millennium. Um, the post-colonial independence movements and criticism, uh, particularly in the middle of the 20th century, also brought a lot of critique with this link between Christianity and colonialism. The slogan, missionary, go home, was a prominent slogan in the midst of the 20th century as more and more um, countries around the globe declared their independence. The Second Vatican Council of the Catholic Church also recognized that the church is the people and the Second Vatican Council embracing the vernacular, embracing various cultural um, traditions within the broader Catholic Church, celebrating the unity in diversity. Liberation theology, the idea of Christ as friend to the poor, as acting in solidarity with the poor, having a preferential option for the poor and the oppressed um, becomes a prominent way of expressing the faith, particularly in Latin America. And with globalization, particularly with the globalization of communication and travel, more and more people are in contact with others who are not representative of their own cultural background. Here's a quote from a historian of mission, Laman Sane, who talks about um, the translation process and the importance of this shift that as we see the translation process, particularly with the Bible being translated into hundreds of other language, languages, it is that point that we see this extraordinary growth of Christianity by access to, Christ, or to the scriptures in um, one's own mother tongue. So Lam and Sani have others have talked about the um, indigenization process and how this growth of Christianity is largely a grassroots phenomenon rather than a Western imposition. Here's a quote from another historian of Christian mission, Dana Robert who says, ultimately the most interesting lessons from the missionary outreach during the Western colonial era is what happened to Christianity when the missionaries weren't looking and after the colonizers withdrew. If we look at the current stats of Christian affiliation, um, particularly if you look at growth rates, you can see the growth rates of Christians in the African and Asian context, context far surpasses that in North America and Europe. And if we look at um, the pure numbers in terms of who identifies as Christian, we can see that in Africa and Latin America, we have the largest numbers of Christians. So the typical Christian in the contemporary context is not a white man from Europe or North America. The typical Christian by the numbers is a brown or black woman from Africa or Latin America. In the middle of the 20th century, I think largely in response to some of these changes, there are a lot of 
of um, revisiting of our understandings of mission on behalf of, of theologians, scholars, leaders within the church. Many contemporary Christians, particularly in a progressive or mainline context, now understand mission not as the propagation of the faith or the, the church's conversion of the heathens, but rather the participation of the people of God in God's action in the world. This is a quote by the missiologist Carlos Cardoza Orlandi, who is a Christian of Caribbean descent. The idea of the missio dei has gained prominence in these circles. The missio dei is the idea that God is the sender and mission, not the church, not individual Christians, not parachurch groups, but that the mission is God's. And this mission is not to extend the territory of Christendom, but rather God's mission, God's errand of salvation, of redemption, of renewal in the world. So understanding mission, not just as evangelism, but as works of justice, mercy, peace, solidarity, um, being the hands and feet of God in the world in a variety of contexts, in a variety of ways. And that mission is at the center of the church's DNA, that mission is the reason the church exists, that the church exists for the sake of the world, for the sake of the flourishing of the world. Um, and that the church gets to participate in this work of God, but not as a way to extend power over others, but rather to join God in co-suffering with the world. The idea that the church is both the subject and the object of mission. This is a prominent idea of Carlos Cardoza Arlandi and others as well that it is that the mission of God is not just to the world, but also to the church, that the church is in constant need of redemption, of renewal, and that God works through the world um, and not just the church. Mission is multi-directional. Mission is not just the, from the so-called West to the so-called rest, but mission is from everywhere to everywhere. And that um, cultural diversity is embraced um, within um, the Christian vision of a, a planet that is thriving. Um, we see this in various visions in the New Testament. We see this in Acts. We see this in Revelation. The idea that Christianity is embedded in various cultures, celebrating those cultures rather than a, a monolithic um, generic faith that um, is a cover for white normativity. Um, and finally, mission focused on Jesus's vision of the reign of God. So when we look at this idea of Christianity as empire, Christendom, um, oftentimes the, this is linked to the kingdom of God imagery that we see in the gospels. When Jesus talks about the, the reign of God, however, Jesus is presenting a very different picture. Jesus is not presenting this empire that Christians extend or enlarge or build, but rather this reign of God's love, justice, and peace that is intended for the flourishing of all creation, which we are invited to receive as a gift and which we are invited to welcome like children. So Jesus's vision of the reign of God and the Greek basileia to Theo is a very different picture than Christendom. So here are three models of, um, of mission. And I just wanna give the example of evangelism within these three models and how they differ. So missiologists sometimes talk about this Christendom model as the old paradigm. Um, and this old paradigm prominent in the modern period from about 1500 um, onward. And we still see uh, many examples of this old paradigm today. But evangelism is understood as soul winning. Um, evangelism is conquest, these twin aims of civilizing and Christianizing. 
one directional movement in mission from the Western world to the rest of the world. And within this paradigm, salvation is essentially reduced to two periods in time and the rest of history is largely irrelevant. So those two points in time are the death of Christ, which makes individual salvation possible, and then the conversion of the individual. And the idea is that um, salvation is this transaction, um, to put it crudely, where the individual moves from the unsaved category to the saved category. Um, and um, the critique of many within the new paradigm is that this makes the rest of human living and life on this planet essentially irrelevant by sal salvation being this transactional and otherworldly phenomenon. The convert's culture within this paradigm is considered backward or demonic and God is only found within the church. The church growth model, which we see particularly in the American context, um, and this became prominent in the 1970s, we still see it today. Um, many mega churches in the US context embraced this paradigm, the church growth model of borrowing market principles um, to um, attract people to the church. So this attractional model of mission where you have fancy programs, um, maybe there's a Starbucks in the lobby and an amazing Easter cantata complete with dry ice, um, and that there's a, a very therapeutic and individualistic emphasis within Christianity. It is a, a product to be bought and sold. Um, the church growth model, many um, contemporary missiologists within the new paradigm would critique as being essentially an outgrowth of the old model, but just on steroids within a, a market Comp, uh, market capitalism context in the U.S. Uh, within the new paradigm, or the Basileia to Theo model, the reign of God model, embracing that vision of Jesus in the Gospels and the New Testament, evangelism is understood pretty differently. Evangelism is sharing the good news, not just about Jesus and about um, personal salvation, but also the good news that Jesus proclaimed, the Sermon on the Mount, the liberation of the captive, um, the, the, the favored place in, in, in God's um, reign for those who are poor, those who are oppressed, those who are, who are marginalized. The world's logic is upended. Um, the first are last, the last are first. And people who are poor and who are marginalized are not just opportunities for outreach, these people represent God in the world, that we find in them the face of God, and we find in them the people whom Jesus was most attracted to, not just to save or to change, but as his friends. This Basileia, again, is not an empire to be built, but rather a gift to be received and a realm to enter. Um, evangelism is understood as living beautifully and truthfully, um, the witness of not just words, but also actions, and an outpouring of holiness that we can't give what we don't have. This comes from theologist Elaine Heath within the United Methodist tradition, um, who's written a book about the mystic way of evangelism this idea that evangelism is an outpouring of our own interior um, lives and our own interior connection to this reign of God in the world. The invitation of evangelism is not just to follow rules or believe propositions, but an invitation to a way of life that is based on a transformative experience of divine love. So this contrasts, I think, the new paradigm, how mission is, is often stood, understood um, by missiologists today, particularly within um, more progressive contexts um, compared to the old paradigm. Now, of course, this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that contemporary Christian communities are always embodying this new paradigm. Um, in fact, I think we still see many examples of the link between mission and colonialism or neo-imperialism 
even in how we go about representing the church in the world today. I think looking at maps of Africa um, in the colonial period, in the contemporary period, the colonial Africa, you can see European flags spread across the continent. Contemporary Africa, we have the flags of, of independent countries. Um, I think even this, this depiction begs the question of what does it mean to engage in mission um, with an understanding of Christians around the world as our brothers and sisters and humans around the world as our brothers and sisters rather than people um, for whom we have the right or obligation to um, impose our um, empire, our way of understanding. Particularly, I think this question is one that hits home for Christians in the US and Europe with privileged status. So uh, before we go to questions and comments, I wanna just reflect on this question of praying thy kingdom come, living into this notion of the kingdom of God being God's and it being um, God's kingdom in which we are invited, what does that mean in our context? And um, this, this painting by Thomas Cole, The Course of Empire, Destruction, if we look historically, we can see that all empires that have risen have fallen. And there are many questions I think about the contemporary American empire and if we are at the beginning of its demise. Um, and I think this is another danger that many contemporary missiologists have observed with the notion of Christianity being linked to empire, this Christendom conception, that um, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So what does it mean in our contemporary context to pray thy kingdom come looking at the reign of God as the work of God in the world to which all of us are invited um, rather than as a birthright or as a weapon. So that is gonna be the subject for next week as we look at contemporary um, understandings and examples of the idea of the Basileia to Theo, the new paradigm of mission trying to more faithfully live into this idea of the kingdom of God, the reign of God as something we are invited into, um, not as those who steer or control or build, but those who are invited to bear witness. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and go to the chat. So uh, thank you for your, your comment, Patsy. Um, I think if we look at, you know, in the US and contemporary examples of mission, um, I think it can be helpful for us to look at this Christendom model of mission as we analyze how our individual Christian communities, how our churches um, treat other people uh, within our own communities and around the world. And you know, even within short-term mission trips, for instance, this is a very prominent practice, um, at least pre-pandemic, and I'm, I'm guessing post-pandemic as well, of how contemporary North American Christians engage in the world. Um, the rhetoric surrounding short-term mission trips is often this idea of, you know, we're, we're going to go um, bring Christ um, to these areas, which is, is kind of ironic considering that if we look at international mission trips, 80% um, of these mission trips are undertaken in areas um, where the vast majority of the population is already Christian. So the idea that you know, North American Christians are the ones bringing the gospel um, when, again, these, these mission trips take place in contexts that are already predominantly Christian, I think is an example of the link between colonialism and, and North American Christianity that we can still see in many ways today. 
Um, also the idea that, you know, if we're going to build a church or conduct an, a vacation Bible school, that we know more about their context than they do. So within the new paradigm, um, instead questions emerge such as how can we walk alongside people um, in their own context? Those who are within a context are the ones who are most poised to understand what that context needs or desires. So Christians from other cultures um, should come along and support and accompany um, Christians in different contexts, but that is not their role to, to lead or control or to tell them how things should be done. Um, I think we can see this too, even in, in how many Christian communities of privilege interact with, um, with other people in their own cities and towns. Um, here in Memphis, I think relationships between white churches and black churches can sometimes, um, there, can, there can sometimes be um, this agenda or the residue of the old paradigm of mission, the Christendom approach to mission. Um, you know, I've heard of, of white communities coming in and, um, you know, in, in black churches and we're going to plant a flower bed right over here, um, you know, an area where the trucks come in to load and three weeks later that flower bed is gone because it wasn't wanted or needed. Um, and so again, these, these patterns, I think, are still functioning in today's world. Um, someone's asking to repeat what Patty's, Patsy's question was, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, so she was asking about um, behavior exhibited um, in the US today um, and how that might, how this understanding of mission as the expansion of Christendom might help illuminate some of those patterns that we see today. For those who are still on the call, are there any other questions or comments that can either go in the Q&A or the chat? Are there any elements, this, this uh, question comes from Jack. Are there any elements of the old model of evangelism or the old model of church growth that should be preserved or should we just throw it out and start all over again? I think that's a really, a really um, provocative question. And it's at this point that I wish that we could all see each other. So I could throw that question back out to you and see what you think. I think my, my personal understanding of that question, how I would respond to that question would be that, yes, I think we can look back um, historically and see that there was good mixed in with the bad. Um, and if we look at um, Christian mission efforts around the globe, I think there are examples, um, imperfect examples certainly, but examples nonetheless of, of Christian missionaries living among the people, um, living among the people in a variety of contexts, learning from them, recognizing that the spirit of God has no bounds and that all people are created in the image of God. And that cross-cultural relationships, I think, can be rich opportunities for both parties. Um, certainly the disparities, particularly between those um, who are white within the North American context and the European context, and those who have brown or black skin um, within Europe or North America and around the world, I think that we can't ignore those disparities. And that's perhaps another problem with many mission efforts is that there, the uh, backdrop of colonialism, the legacy of imperialism isn't acknowledged. But in instances in which there is a recognition that all of us have needs um, and how can we work together to meet those needs, 
And for Christians coming in from outside contexts, uh, when there is an appreciation for and a deference to leaders within a local community, I think there can be some amazing fruits of cross-cultural relationships. Um, so, you know, oftentimes my students in my classes will ask, well, should we just, you know, stop traveling to other um, countries? Should we, um, you know, just cancel all of our mission trips? And I don't think that's the, the answer either. Um, I think that cross-cultural relationships um, are still a very important part of, of Christian faith. And even if we look back to New Testament examples of the cultural diversity within the Christian community, um, appreciating that cultural diversity, joining together, particularly at the table, communion fellowship, I think this is a powerful example of um, how we um, as human beings are all connected and all connected as um, as beloved children of God. This comes from an anonymous attendee. Assuming that not everyone in or outside the quote unquote church accepts or understand that, that understands that living into God's gift of loving just relationships, how does one get started on the path and what beyond living it out is the role of those who are aware of this paradigm and helping others get started. Um, thank you for that question. So yeah, I think that's a really important question as well. Um, and particularly for those of us who have power and privilege in society, I do think it is our responsibility um, when we see actions that um, are living into a legacy of imperialism, of power over others, that we draw attention to it. Um, and not necessarily in a way, um, or not, hopefully not in a way suggesting that we have all the answers or that we are you know, more woke than others. Um, but nonetheless, if we do not draw attention to these patterns, um, that they will perpetuate so I think it is important, you know, when a committee meeting is happening or when a trip is being planned or when a, you know, sister church service is being conceptualized that we ask questions about who is leading, uh, who is being represented, um, whose voice is being heard. And asking these questions can help uncover what I think is often um, just part of, of the backdrop and therefore not called into question. And if we look at, you know, patterns of engagement in mission around the world, um, going upstream is always going to be a challenge. Um, and I think that within the contemporary American context, which is so polarized, people who are perceived as being you know, liberal or progressive are often perceived as being self-righteous and arrogant. And so I think that's also part of the challenge of contextualization within our own context. You know, how can people who, um, you know, are allied with more progressive causes or institutions, how can they communicate with people allied with more conservative causes? But nonetheless, I do think, especially for those of us in positions of privilege in society, if we want to follow Jesus, then we are going to follow Jesus to elevating the voices of those who are marginalized and oppressed, um, and not just reaching out to those people as somehow in need of what we have to offer, but seeing those, those people as our guides and teachers, leaders, and friends. Final question here before we sign off. What accounts for the surge of conversion to Christianity in Africa and Asian countries? Um, missionaries? So I think the conversion of 
Christians or of, of people to Christianity in Africa, Latin America, and Asia over the course of the 20th century um, is a fascinating phenomenon. And much of it, I think, is connected to what is happening, what was happening on the ground in those particular countries. Um, and the opportunity for um, people within those countries to hear the gospel story um, in their own um, idioms, in their own um, cultural representations, and to see in Jesus a friend to the poor, a friend to the marginalized, and the notion that they were God's beloved children. So um, I think my interpretation of, of the answer to that question, although very complex, is that um, the conversion to Christianity for people in Africa and Latin America and Asia in the 20th century is because they recognized the good news of the gospel, um, affirming their dignity, affirming um, th that, that God's um, call to um, be part of what God doing in the what God was doing in the world was for them, um, and that in Jesus we can see um, God um, being incarnated in a person who um, not only associated with people who did not have power, who were marginalized in their context, but who was poor, who was marginalized, who was oppressed. Um, so we're at 10 o'clock today. If you are available next Sunday, I very much encourage you to join in again. Next Sunday, we're gonna focus on contemporary, um, the contemporary period, uh, the context here in North America for Christians who want to be engaged in a new paradigm in mission, who want to um, be invited into this Basileia to Theo, the reign of God, um, participating in God's work of, of justice, mercy, and love in the world. So what might that look like on the ground? That will be our topic for next week. Um, I thank everybody for joining. And if you have any questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, I invite you to email me um, at jbakker at memphisseminary.edu. So thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.